This is Twit. Well, folks, it's now time for the bites. Now, this first one is is going to hit close to home, to, especially to one of our co-hosts here. Now, the education sector has always found it challenging to maintain the security of its services and systems. And it's a challenge for organizations that sometimes spend millions of dollars a year, let alone government funding technology. Now, let's face it, things are not always well-funded for schools, right? Well, then steps in COVID-19 and throws another wrench into the wheel. Now, school districts in the United States already had significant cybersecurity shortcomings. They often lack dedicated funding and skilled personnel to continuously vet and improve cybersecurity defenses. Now, as a result, many schools make basic setup system setup errors or leave old vulnerabilities unpatched. Now, it's like them propping a back door open so hackers can get in. We don't want that to happen. Now, schools and students also face potential exposure from third-party education technology firms that actually fail to secure their data and their platforms adequately. Now, the pandemic amplified these risks. School districts around the country transitioned to distance learning in the spring. They kind of were thrown into it. And suddenly, millions of teachers and students relied on video chat software, lesson portals, digital messaging boards, and other online tools. And if these systems are set up without proper authentication controls, they can become vectors for attack. Now, tools to access to school networks remotely can also be a problem here, including VPNs, remote desktop protocols, can be abused by attackers to gain unauthorized access to sensitive systems. Now, last week, in fact, the Federal Bureau of Investigation issued a security alert about the threat of ransomware to schools amidst the COVID-19 crisis. Listen to this number. In the past 30 days, More than 4.7 million malware incidents were detected in the education industry broadly worldwide. Now, now that is actually according to Microsoft's Global Threat Activity Tracker. Now, this is more than 60% of all the corporate and institutional malware incidents reported during that time, 60% of them. Now, the next most effective sector is what Microsoft calls business and professional services with fewer than 1 million incidents. Now, Many schools are ill-equipped here to secure, uh, securely migrate to completely digital learning experience. So it comes in absolutely no surprise that these vulnerabilities are so visible to everybody. Now, I want to go to my co-host here, Chibert, and I want to go to you first because you have some deep experience in the education sector. And I want to kind of hand you a soapbox here for this bite and ask, is this your experience? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> here, 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 here's, here's my soapbox. Schools are really, really bad because on technology adoption because they're straightjacketed in policy, and these policies been made make are being made by people that don't understand the rapidly changing technology um, business that we are in. So here's here's what happened to me personally. Um, I, I was actually running a group within the University of Hawaii where we'd take uh, discarded computers from the university and from the private sector. We would refurbish them and build labs and teach the PT. Literally, we actually taught the PTA how to drop fiber in the ground so we could put a backbone in. And for one particular middle school, we managed to save them at least $100,000. Then came policy. The... Um, Higher up said, no, we can't afford that. That's too much liability. Things like ditch witches and so forth are way too dangerous for the PTA to be running, even though they're being run by people that do this every day for a living, and shut us down. Um, This was after building a lot of labs for different schools. And the sad part is, is this is not just in IT. I've had several PTAs tell me about how a professional plumbing company bonded in everything. The father of one of these girls in an elementary school volunteered to go and add a sink to help the elementary school teacher be able to do art lessons. But the school board said not only no, but heck no, and proceeded to go out to bid for a sink that cost an insane amount of money to be put in. This is what needs to be solved. Schools would probably get a lot more help if the school boards would work with the lawyers and try to deal with some of this liability issue. 
It's not that these people aren't bonded. It's not that these people aren't trustworthy. It's that the school boards are unwilling to work with the private sector to leverage what little budget money they have. You know, the people are going to Chromebooks because they don't have the IT specialist and Google has created Chrome as tailor-made for education. But they lose out on a lot of capabilities because Windows is perfectly capable of doing the same thing. So are Macintoshes. Um, but anyway, I, I soapbox and soapbox and soapbox. It's time to let the other people have a word in sideways. But I really and truly think the answer to this isn't just technology. It's policy and the lack of it. The good points there. I think, Curtis, I want to throw this to you because, you know, in the enterprise space, obviously a lot of organizations are handling a lot of this right now, a lot of services, and they have they have a lot of expertise there. Is there anything that the, the enterprise can do to help the EDU space here? Well, I think there are some lessons, and, and some of them have begun to be learned by the educational space. For example, there are many ways in which moving things to, uh, to the cloud can help because it frees up other resources to go ahead and look at these donated services. Um, the big thing, though, is the fact that it has become so very difficult to have someone volunteer. And now, let me say that the last time I was doing a lot of this was somewhere close to 15 years ago uh, when I my son was in high school. Uh, I was involved in the music program at his school. I was involved in the theater program. Uh, I, I'm a pianist and organist. I do accompanying of, of singers and, and productions. Uh, I also consulted on the technology advisory committees for the schools. And it reached a point where just to be able to be on campus, they were requiring extensive and, let me say, expensive background checking for any volunteer. It's, it's a terrible dance that they have to do. And this is, again, something that enterprises can, can help with because while a company has to feel confident in the security stance of anyone that it allows onto its corporate campus. Uh, schools have to do the same thing and they have taken what is unfortunately a very common point of view, which is we won't deal with the problem. We'll simply outlaw all participation. Um, I think what they need to do, especially today, is figure out ways to deal with it, figure out where the risks actually lie, and sit there and find solutions. Unfortunately, in too many cases, figuring out where these risks lie involves taking away some profit potential for a handful of educational contractors, and therefore, you know, the economics and the justification for doing it can be hard to come by. Makes sense. Now, Chibbert, I want to throw this last one to you because, you know, you said, hey, there, there is one thing they can do. What about, what about training? What about if we train their users more? Because obviously, sometimes, uh, you know, you have your weakest links in your system and most of the time that's your users. Is the cheapest thing here maybe to just do a little training on some best practices here? Because I, I have personal experience here. I've dealt with my three kids having to deal with online uh, learning, you know, in the in the elementary space. And I can definitely tell you the teachers were just not ready. They just weren't familiar with the services and how to use them efficiently, securely. Is this something that we they could do better that actually helps maybe alleviate some of this? Uh, I think actually the answer needs to come from the teachers unions. The reality that I've been working with is only a small, I mean, really small number of teachers are willing to take an extra effort to go and get trained up on emerging technologies and emerging um, fields to enrich themselves. These uh, teacher enrichment days are too far and few between. 
So one of the things that I challenge teachers to do is what you can work with the private sector. You have to be willing to use some of your enrichment days or enrichment hours that the unions do allow you to do and work with them. Um, I know a lot of the private sector that would love to be able to help out, would love to do classes for you. Um, but you got to keep in mind, these poor people have to make money too. And if you're going to demand that the private sector goes and does things um, during prime time, you know, when they're supposed to be on a nine to five job, you're not going to have as many takers. But if you're willing to meet them halfway, do things like Saturdays or early evenings or maybe a um, potluck or a brown bag dinner. Um, I've done that for a couple of schools and the results have been stunning. Uh, there is ways to do this. It's just the sad part is, is teachers, you got to meet them halfway. I know you're underpaid. I know you're understaffed and all that. But if you want to get ahead of the game, maybe you need to take a page from some of the technology industries where you're constantly learning and you go and try and meet these professionals halfway so that they can help you help yourself.